Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar. It feels like I cover a copyright situation like every six minutes, okay? I swear to God, it's not that I'm trying to make it my, my content, so to speak. But I like deep dives and I like deep analysis and I like looking at situations like this. Because for me, I'm one of the firm believers that everyone falls off. You know, your time on YouTube, you peak, you, 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 you placate, and then you're done, okay? But if you don't try to make this platform better than when it was when you started, then you're not spending your time wisely. And when it comes to false copyright abuses, false copyright abuses can absolutely change the landscape of YouTube. It can change the way that plenty of creators produce content. It can change the way that even you might be able to consume certain pieces of content. Now, honestly, copyright abuse happens a lot from some of the biggest companies in the world. But genuinely, I have a special hate in my heart when it comes between creator to creator, because generally, if it's done maliciously, which is what it appears to be 95% of the time, uh, then it can ruin, again, the landscape of the platform. And I understand today's uh, you know individual we're discussing is a person known as Business Casual. Now, you might be like, whoa, that name's familiar, Muda. Yeah, Business Casual is a channel with 1.17 million subscribers. And uh, they made a video called Why I'm Suing YouTube August 16th of 2022. Now, of course, this was a pretty wild video. I was asked to cover it when it came out. And the reason I didn't was because a couple other YouTubers came up and talked to me. I'm not gonna mention their name just so I can, uh, just, again, I don't wanna like, you know, bring in names that don't really need to be brought in. But there were a couple of creators that came and reached out to me, a couple of fans reached out to me, and I looked into the situation. And the reason I didn't cover it was because A, it was covered really well by another channel, friend of the show, Upper Echelon, who does really good content, really good dives into a lot of topics, topics that I myself cover and am interested into. And he did a pretty good job covering it. I looked at it myself and I found that this was a very, very shaky video. So to give you an idea of what I'm talking about over here, Business Casual is a channel that pretty much uh, was, from what I understand, owned by somebody else. It was bought by another individual whose only video to this channel was why I'm suing YouTube. Now, the last video before that was two years ago. Then this video came out and that was pretty much what it was. Initially, when it dropped, there was claims that maybe YouTube was suppressing the truth because, oh, they don't want people to find out about such a lawsuit, which again, could be the case. It could also not be the case. That didn't stop business casual from what I understand. And some of these screenshots I have did come from Upper Echelon because he did a good job archiving. And as you can imagine, when people are caught and you know people are contradicted and when people are you know sort of put a spotlight onto, uh, a lot of things suddenly get deleted, okay? So thank God for YouTube archivists. 70,000 plus of our subscribers have push notifications enabled. How many were notified of our video exposing YouTube? A whopping zero. So of course, ladies and gentlemen, some notifications weren't sent. Obviously, this appears to be a bug, a glitch in the system. Could YouTube be suppressing it? Look, I'm not ruling it out. I don't know what the hell happens at YouTube behind the scenes. Nobody really does. But again, I like to think of the situation with a bit more, uh, I guess you could say, uh, utilizing your fucking brain cells, okay? If you are uploading from a channel, that's last video is two years ago, and then you upload why I'm suing YouTube eight months ago, there's a massive gap between content being uploaded. So to understand, maybe the people that have had the bell on just don't give a shit anymore. And sometimes videos don't perform really well. Hell, if I was to look at my own channel, right, sometimes videos do really well. You know, if I look at things like this guy's ruining YouTube, obviously that one did a bit better than Redfall is a truly awful video game. Investigating the cat video was 620K views three days ago. And then of course, some videos don't pop off. It is what it is. It's how mafia works, my guy. That's how the internet is. So to say that YouTube was blocking your video, you would need a lot more proof than just that one error that you showed in the analytics. You didn't really show where other traffic was coming from. And if YouTube was really blocking your video, ain't no fucking way you were getting 2.1 million views when you have almost half of that as your subscriber base. Clearly your video got featured in the recommended algorithm, which is where most views for a video come from. The other thing was looking at some of the inflammatory shit on this video. So this was during the peak of the US-Russian sanctions. So about a year ago, a war in Ukraine kicked off, uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, and obviously public perception towards Russia wasn't all the way there. And to be honest, it still kind of isn't, all right? People are, it's a very politicized topic.
If you read the description, I'm not playing any clips because I don't want a copyright strike from Business Casual, even though I will probably 100% be in the right. I say probably because in order to prove fair use and copyright to be factually, you know, right in your favor, you have to go to a court of law. Anyways, reading the description, this is a true story, a story about YouTube's intentional efforts to undermine the US of A in collusion with the Russian government. It's also a story about copyright infringement and YouTube's willful blindness to bad actors who openly admit to filing patently false DNA MCA counter notifications to avoid the termination of their accounts. So ladies and gentlemen, he says business casual CEO Alex Edson exposes YouTube for turning a blind eye to brazen repeated and obvious infringements to their copyrighted videos. In the video, you will see how YouTube has acted and continues to act in the direction of the Kremlin. Again, YouTube has no reason to work with them. This video was uploaded August 16th of 2022. If Alex Etson's claims are to even be remotely believable, looking at YouTube's own channel monetization policies, YouTube in March 10, 2022, or sorry, March 3rd said, due to the ongoing war in Ukraine, we will temporarily be pausing Google and YouTube ads from serving to users located in Russia. Also, we are pausing access to all monetization features such as channel memberships, super chats, super stickers, merch for viewers in Russia. Also in March 10th, they said, given the recent suspension of Google advertising systems in Russia, we'll be pausing the creation of new Russian accounts on AdSense, AdMob, Google Ad Manager. Additionally, we will pause ads on Google properties and networks globally for advertisers based in Russia. As a result, creators in Russia won't be able to complete new YouTube partner program signups at this time. The implication that YouTube is somehow capitulating to the Russian government and undermining the US on a DMCA dispute between a Russian state media organization and a YouTube channel in the United States by simply not offering some level of automatic bias towards the American is a bit absurd because in order with DMCA safe harbor provisions, obviously YouTube's not gonna jump into this bat anyways. Now, while YouTube, yes, is not profiteering off of any Russian viewers, yes, people who are from other countries who are watching a Russian channel's YouTube video would still, from from what I understand, be providing money to an active AdSense partner. But generally speaking, YouTube is complying as much as they can with the current sanctions in place. Uh, tech companies, if they were suddenly told not to at all work with Russians or vice versa, so to speak, then YouTube would comply. They're really showing no signs of them actually breaking the law or undermining, again, quote unquote, the United States government, uh, because this is a very gross mischaracterization of the situation. And and uh, I imagine YouTube also believes the same. I imagine any third party looking at the situation with clear eyes would realize that this isn't exactly as cut and dry as it may seem from Business Casual's video. So anyways, I know that I'm getting into a million different things right now, but I'm trying to point out why this video is really shocking to me. The other big reality of it, and this is a clip that comes from Upper Echelon, where he actually received an email from Alex basically talking about how he was incendiary against him, Upper Echelon basically got this, where he said, hey, it's evident you did not actually watch my video. So here he actually mentions that, you mentioned that Russia only uses a few snippets. So in what Upper Echelon was saying that Alex was using like a couple seconds of footage at a time to basically, you know, within fair use, cover a piece of, you know, uh, co cover a topic, so to speak, or cover actual events. Your claims are categorically flasse. I assume Alex was trying to write the word false, which at that point I have to tell you, try a spell checker. As shown in our video, at least two of RT's videos actually infringed 28 separate copyrighted scenes from our video, totaling one minute and 28 seconds of our content. So basically their whole team sat through Russia Today's channel and found one minute and 28 seconds of their content spread across 28 infringement cases. Now, of course, in this case, it really does appear that uh, if we were to take 88 seconds of content and divide it by, again, 28 seconds of copyrighted scenes, we're looking at around three seconds on average, a little over of content used. So I don't know, it depends on what he's talking about, what the infringement is. Again, this is to go to a court case and we're trying to see if this is actually abusive of his copyright. Again, fair use and the DMCA relies on a few tests. And uh, generally, if this is good faith or not, we'd have to look at the content. Now in this, he pretty much, the general summary of it, he wanted this channel pretty much removed because since they had three copyright strikes, 
Three strikes means that YouTube should remove your channel and basically every other channel associated to you, which Russia today has several, about over, I think, 20 or 30 channels. Another sign that YouTube isn't work on working with the Kremlin, so to speak, is a sign that YouTube has actually been blocking a lot of these Russian state-backed media organizations. Look, good luck trying to find Russia Today or any of its associated channels today on YouTube. Even if they try to come back where there were allegations that there were other channels like Dig Dig Documentary that was apparently like belonging to Russia Today, that also doesn't appear to be active on YouTube either. So clearly YouTube is going above and beyond their requirements to US sanctions as an American tech company and not undermining the Kremlin, it seems. So I don't know where that fucking wild uh, accusation or inflammatory statement came out of. And I can imagine YouTube's lawyers aren't too proud, and I can imagine if you're a third-party viewer of this situation, you might be wondering just why the situation was presented in the way that it was. Now again, what Alex failed to tell us, and I'm going to be digging up a sworn affidavit from Alex himself, uh, this isn't necessarily even the case. Russia Today didn't even need to get removed. So again, based on a sworn affidavit uh, coming at him, TV Novosti, associated channels identified by the letters Russia Today, RT, of which there are at least 38 as confirmed by YouTube, enjoy access to YouTube's managed CMS technology. So here he basically exposed that Russia Today's channels were running under the CMS system. What is the CMS system? Well, let's look at YouTube themselves. According to YouTube, the content manager, the managed content manager system over here, when it comes to copyright strikes, when a channel receives a copyright strike, channel level penalties are applied. Partners should avoid accumulating copyright strikes across their managed channels. Failure to do so will result in penalties applied to their content manager in addition to existing channel strike policies. So one could argue that channel level penalties, if you get three strikes, you should be removed. But to remove everything under your wagon doesn't make sense because they said if a partner, they being YouTube, receives 10 copyright strikes across managed channels in a 90 day period, then the partner is subject to further review. The results of which may include loss of the ability to link channels, loss of the ability to upload videos, and termination of the partnership agreement. After 90 days, copyright strikes will expire. So again, if you looked at throughout the course of a fucking year, you could basically have up to what, 40 copyright strikes, right? Like assuming that, you know, they all keep expiring. Again, they only got three, it seems, not 10. So again, YouTube <laughs> didn't have to remove them, which makes a lot of his case seem really bullshit to me. And it's the reason why I never covered it. So because of DMCA safe harbor provisions, you can read it for yourself right here. A good uh, example of it was this article on TechDirt. Here lies the problem. There's no plausible claim of liability for YouTube. There may well be a plausible claim against TV Novosti, but that doesn't magically make YouTube liable as well. Indeed, the case is complicated by the fact that Business Casual uploads its video to YouTube, granting YouTube a license to them. That doesn't mean that TV Novosti gets a license, but it doesn't mean that suing YouTube for infringement, especially direct infringement, makes no sense, as it already has a license to the work and therefore cannot be infringing. Again, the lawsuit against YouTube is very messy, not because they're just a large company anyways, but also uh, this is a clear sign of what it appears to be somebody not understanding safe harbor provisions and the law. So I know, long summary, Muto, why did you have to go down this route? It's because I wanted to explain to you the situation that I never once covered, but also where it's actually leading to. Now, recently there's been a YouTuber known as Magnates Media, who's basically said a YouTuber called Business Casual has filed three copyright strikes against my channel claiming that I've used seconds of similar footage. These three strikes mean that I've received an email from YouTube saying in a few days, my channel is going to be deleted. Now, again, I looked at these copyright strikes, again, thanks to Upper Echelon for the uh, actual coverage here and the screenshots that we can actually view ourselves. So again, these copyright strikes, which I can't confirm if this one is Business Casual Holdings, but these two are from Business Casual Holdings, LLC. Now the video in question here, I can't confirm if these two videos, the JP Morgan and Starbucks one, are actually violating anything. I am, however, going to look into the how Andrew Carnegie became the richest man. This video was taken down by Business Casual Holdings. Why? Because seven seconds of content was used in this video. So now it's time to examine what those seven seconds of content were and if they were actually, you know, infringing any copyright. Now, according to Upper Echelon, who had the screenshots over here, from zero to world's richest man, right? That was the actual uh, title for the video. Yeah, that was the one right there. I just got to check in my notes. 
And uh, this video uh, was 53 minutes long. Uh, Business Casuals video was 16 minutes long. And basically this image was basically the target point. Now, what is this image you might ask? So this image is from the Library of Congress, okay? The Carnegie Steel Plant Homestead, Pennsylvania. And if you look into this image right here, it's pretty cute, all right? If I compare it back to our, uh, to our friend's content, so to speak. Uh, yeah, this is the exact uh, same image, all right? Same chimney, same everything. Now, this image, if we scroll all the way down this page to rights and access, the Library of Congress believes that many of the papers in the Detroit Publishing com uh, Company collection are in the public domain or have no copyright restrictions and are free to reuse and reuse. For example, all photos published in the U.S. more than 95 years ago are in the public domain. So when was this image uh, published, by the way? Let me let me get let me get an exact. 1905. Yeah, I'd say it fits the fucking bill, huh? Now, of course, we look at what public domain is. Public domain refers to creative materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws, such as copyright, trademark, or patent laws. So anybody can use this image. If I want to take this image and rotoscope it onto GTA 5, I can. It's my right, okay? I can do some motion tracking, add some lens flare. You know it. Now, of course, what happened over here was Business Casual apparently filed a copyright claim for what appears to be similar editing. Now, here's where I'm going to play a section of Business Casual's video in fair use, okay? The reason why I'm saying it's in fair use is I'm going to be critiquing the differences, and if Business Casual believes that I'm violating his copyright, obviously he can use the YouTube copyright system, but I will absolutely be fighting it, okay? Because I believe what I am about to do is within fair use. So let's watch this, okay? So on the right here is Magnates Media, and on the left belongs to Business Casual's video. So if we actually see what's going on over here, you can see that in Magnates Media, they've got a, you know, uh, uh, I guess you could say a parallax effect. So this kind of weird effect that you would see in, in like a lot of videos where like parts of the image are moving in different relations to different parts of the image. It's something that uh, you can see uh, plenty of people do. It's, not, it's, it's a very common editing routine. In fact, it appears that even in this case, um, Magnates Media provided, their, their editor provided the timeline of them actually doing it themselves. So again, it appears, based on what I'm looking at, that these effects are very different, okay? You've got color grading that's different, Magnates has explosions, you've got, you know, these uh, fire effects, these, the, these various, like, you know, alpha effects that are happening, far different than what we're seeing over here on business casual side, okay? So again, if this was to go to a court of law, I think any judge would laugh this shit out. This looks like copyright trolling. But of course, as you all know, when it comes to copyright trolling, all right, it really does seem like business casuals, uh, you know, actual claim to fame really is covering, it's not so much making content because he hasn't uploaded a video since he was suing YouTube, but rather he's just tweeting out at companies about, hey, I'd like to report an infringement of your series. May I ask for an appropriate person to contact? Uh, good luck, I guess. <laughs> now, again, if Magnates Media absolutely doesn't win these, uh, you know, copyright strikes, then literally tomorrow, since it would be the 11th as of time of doing it, he could have his channel gone, removed off YouTube forever. All that hours, all the hours of work gone. I want to stress that if my editor had literally just ripped several minutes of footage from his content and simply copied it into my own video with no edits, I'd understand the strikes. But he didn't. Yeah, sure, you could argue that maybe the editing might be a little similar to your tastes, but that's not worthy of just filing a copyright strike over, okay? Literally, we watched it. There were very, there were a lot of differences present on that image alone. Anybody could take that public domain, domain image and parallax affect it. It's not an uncommon editing strategy. It's not a patented, you know, editing strategy that Business Casual owns. Plenty of people do it. A couple of weeks ago, there was this Illuminati chick who was fucking going at Legal Eagle about the highlighter effect. You can't just copyright the most generic editing effects out there. Jesus Christ, at least in that situation, copyright strikes weren't handed out, but I mean, it was still cringe. This is cringe, and I would argue it actually breaks the law. Now, Alex claims that they used an AI script uh, for the Carnegie video. So again, 
Uh, Magnate says that he's never used artificial intelligence. This is their Google script with various revisions. I can imagine any time Alex has given any form of criticism, he talks about chat GPT. That's pretty much all it comes down to. Of course, if two creators make a video on the same topic, there are going to be similarities and likely even some of the same sources. True! If I cover a topic and Charlie covers a topic and Upper Echelon covers, covers a topic, we're probably gonna be using similar sources and the same evidence. Now, of course, if I take the exact same script from somebody else and I take the exact same editing shot for shot, word for word, one could argue that absolutely could violate the copyright laws. But this wasn't a similar situation. This were a couple seconds of the same image being given the same parallax effect, which by the way is very common, but there were a lot of materially different things between those two clips. They were posted years apart. The styles, analysis, tone were all totally different too. The only visual similarity is we've used the same publicly available historical image, which is a key part of the story. It is. According to Andrew Carnegie, yes, that steel plant is a key integral moment of the story. I did, of course, try to explain this privately to Alex first and ask him several times if we could work this out between us, creator to creator. But he ignored those messages, and so I felt I had no choice but to make this public in the hope that I can save my channel being deleted. I have lots more evidence if needed, plus a lot of creators have privately contacted me about past issues with Alex themselves. But honestly, I have no interest in YouTube drama. You know, this isn't YouTube drama, okay? This is an abuse of the platform, and YouTube's gotta step in and fucking stop it. So, of course, ladies and gentlemen, this is a situation where I feel like YouTube needs to be coming into, and honestly, YouTube did step in, at least their social media manager, and said, we understand how important this is for you all. We can't mediate copyright disputes. We look into misuse of copyright tools and web forms to prevent abuse. I love how that's one out of one. I'm still waiting for two out of two to drop, by the way. Come on, YouTube, fill us in. Uh, YouTube, this, you know, from the outside looking in is obviously it appears to be a complete abuse of, of copyright laws. And of course, Alex Edson has a history and he's got a history on YouTube where allegedly he has run an, a, an MCN that is allegedly abusive known as Power TV. One that I was able to look up on YouTube with him saying that he was a CEO and founder. Um, again, claiming that they founded Power TV, a talent management agency for YouTube content creators. I went to their company website, but it's dead in the water. Not surprising. So I'm not gonna go pursue that route anyways. And of course, there's allegedly other situations where they made creators lose access to various YouTube features and private videos criticizing the network made by their own creators while taking the majority of their earnings. That's all an allegation. And of course, it gets even wilder from there. Again, because these are allegations, I'm not going to dig too far into them. I feel like for covering the story and the fact that this is mentioned everywhere already anyways, I felt including it was an important part of the story, but I'm not gonna go into it because allegations are allegations. I'm only looking at this particular situation and keeping my scope relegated into the copyright disputes. Alex Etson appears to be an individual that is very keen on abusing the copyright tools that are available on the platform. And to understand, uh, if that was the only abuse of, of copyright, on that one video, I do not think it warrants a strike. And again, to understand, YouTube can't like stop, they can't, they can't, they can't not like uh, process a strike is what I'm saying. The, the, the way that the copyright system is built, YouTube gets a literal legal request, which is what you have to file with YouTube and uh, YouTube has to honor it, okay? It could be a completely bullshit request. It could be a completely legitimate request. YouTube has no way and they can't really jump into mediating it themselves. They don't really want to invest the legal team for it. And also there are safe harbor provisions where they're literally just letting the content be uploaded. And hey, if there's a copyright dispute, deal with it in court. I don't think that Magnate's media should apologize at all. I think what Alex is trying to do is fish for an apology uh, or at least magnates to admit some level of guilt, whether he is guilty or not. Magnate should 100% fight the strike, 100% stand up for himself in front of what appears to be a copyright abuser on the platform. It's also really disgusting to me that Alex filed three actual copyright strikes on an individual, knowing full well, by the way, that three strikes means that yes, your channel is pretty much on forms of termination. I don't even think Magnates can upload a video addressing his followers and telling them of what the upending doom is. And all he can really use is Twitter and other various forms of social media. If I wake up in the morning and Magnates media is gone, then honestly, I really hope to God YouTube reinstates it. And honestly, I really hope to God YouTube actually goes after Alex Edson from what I believe to be the abuse of the copyright tool. YouTube needs to start punishing its fucking creators. They need to start punishing individuals for abusing these tools. 
Too long has this shit actually been happening. And this stuff boils my blood looking at it like this. This isn't somebody downloading anybody's video and posting it onto the internet and profiteering off of it. That I would defend Alex on. This is Alex overstepping the copyright, uh, the copyright system and trying to take down a competing creator. All from a fucking guy that doesn't make content! Holy shit, the world I live in, dude. Anyways, yeah, share this video. If you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am out.